Okay, I'm back with another video. Boy, this is going to be a very interesting one. There's been a lot of interesting things happening in the world, especially in the last few days, last three, four days. Well, as all of you know, it all started last Monday. Apparently, there was a uh, black man who was getting arrested. From what I gather from the news reports, it looks like he possibly tried to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. The police were called and he was arrested for some reason or another. The guy was not resisting arrest. Police got him behind the car. They put him down on the ground, face down. And one cop had his knee into his neck, pushing him down on the ground. The guy died. Now, of course, there's uh, protests everywhere. And the protests have turned into a melee. But now there's some very interesting things about George Floyd, who died, that have come out since all the rioting and looting have started. That makes me question the narrative of this story. But, I'm, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Touch on that later. So you got all this rioting, you got all this looting going on, especially over the last three nights. I think it also was going on Thursday night too. So yeah, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, at least four nights. And it's crazy. It's every major city in this country, every single one of them. The only places that haven't been touched by this, the only two states that haven't been hit by this so far, Alaska, where I'm at, and Hawaii. Sure, there's been some protests here, but we're not seeing the looting and we're not seeing property damage. We're not going to see that in this state. By the way, before I go on, I got to let you know that uh, the video that you're looking at here on the screen is my front yard. It's a tree in my front yard. I figured it would be kind of nice to just have a nice outdoor shot of my view out the front door. Because at least it's somewhat calm. I don't know. I've been watching all this crap over the last, what, three, four days now. I've been watching it. And I can tell you that I'm not calm. And I can tell you, as a Trump supporter, I'm not happy with Trump right now. Because I got to ask a very basic question. We've got the entire country protesting. Rioting, looting, burning. And I got to ask a very basic question. Where the hell is he? Why hasn't he come out on television and made a statement? Why hasn't he called up the National Guard in all the states? Why is he allowing this to occur? I mean, as I record this right now, it is 9.05 a.m. on Monday morning, the 1st of June. It's five minutes after 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we haven't heard a fucking thing out of the president. Nothing. Sure, he's done some tweets. He's called Antifa. A domestic terror organization. Which absolutely they are. I agree with them on. And I think you should further expand on that. And list George Soros as a terrorist as well. As an international terrorist. And go after his finances. Scott flat out said that. Soros. 
should have the military called on him by the president and just be taken out, which I agree with. Now let's talk about who's doing the rioting, the looting, the protesting. Well, it's not your older people. Generally speaking, it's not your middle aged, it's your young. Same age group that was involved in the riots and looting and mayhem in 1992 with the Rodney King riots. That was the big one in L.A. It's the same age group that participated in the Watts riots, 1965. That went on for six days in L.A., and it spread into other cities as well. But even in the 60s, even in the 60s, it did not go nationwide. It wasn't every city. It was some big major cities with some very serious problems. Now, why is it in every major city in this country right now? And a lot of the smaller ones. Small little cities like Lincoln, Nebraska. Jacksonville, Florida. These are not big cities. Spokane, Washington. Not a big city. These aren't big cities at all. Even Palm Beach, Florida. One of the richest cities in the country. You realize that Trump has a house there? That that's where Rush Limbaugh lives? By the way, these are the same people that don't know how to punch a ballot either, a butterfly ballot. That, too, was Palm Beach, Florida in the year 2000 during that election. So it's all the younger people that are doing this. And why are they doing this? Do you really think that these people really, truly care about George Floyd dying? If you ask most of them, they're not even going to be able to tell you his name. You go up to them and you ask them, well, who is George George Floyd? And I can guarantee you with the educational level that most of them have, Most of them will probably say, well, he was the first president of the United States, wasn't he? What was that in like uh, 1974 or 75? That's what they would say. They don't know what they're protesting about. They don't know the details. They're not protesting because... A black guy was killed by a white cop. Sure, some of them are. But that's not what this is about. This is about the socioeconomic destruction of this country. And it's been going on for a long time. March 17th. This year. Essentially, most of the governors around the country coordinated together and they started to lock everything down. Now, you know my opinion about the hoax virus, the COVID-19. You know, the virus that's been out since 1965, which, by the way, was the same year of the Watts riots in the 60s. 
1965, you have the Watts riots. 1965, coronavirus in the human population is discovered. Coronavirus actually dates back to about uh, the early 1900s. I think around the about 1915, 1913, somewhere around there. It was right about World War I. It was discovered, I believe it was in the monkey population, either the monkey or the bat, one of the two. But they actually discovered it in the human population in 1965. So we know that's a hoax. And we know that's a hoax because of what's been going on in the economy. And what's been going on in the economy, and I've mentioned this in several videos, it's essentially the collapse of the dollar. We are witnessing, for the first time in our history, in the United States, a complete and total collapse of the currency. Now, in one of my other videos, the one, I, I think it's called uh, $207,000 in gold or something like that, where I showed uh, my gold holdings at the time and how much it was. And I profiled a book on there. And the name of the book, it's called When Money Dies. And it was written by Adam Ferguson. The book was written in 1975. So it was written the year that Americans were allowed to own gold for the first time since 1933. Now, I knew the history about this in some detail prior to reading this book, and I thought that I, I had actually read the book. So when I profiled it on that video last July, I thought that I had already read it, but I pulled it off the shelf one day a few weeks ago and I realized, looking at it, that I hadn't read it. Now, the name of the book, like I said, it's called When Money Dies, but the subtitle is The Nightmare of Deficit Spending, Devaluation, and Hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany. Now, I knew most of the history, but this book goes into greater detail, and it talks about, in this book, the deficit spending, the devaluation, the hyperinflation in Germany from 1919 up until 1925. And it goes into great detail about why it happened what the responses were as the inflation went up. Now, one of the reasons, the main reason, it's not the only reason, and I, I shouldn't even say that it was the main reason because Germany was having problems even prior to this. This dates back to World War I, which started in 1914 and it ended in 1918. And up until 1918, when wars were fought, the nations that lost essentially had to pay war reparations. They had to pay for the cost of war, not only for themselves, but for the other nation that defeated them as well. And that's what happened to Germany. Germany essentially signed. Um, a peace treaty to agree to pay a certain amount of money in war reparations. Essentially, they were strong-armed into it. Well, at the time, though, the entire world was on a gold standard. And the Germany, German government, they had to pay their war reparations in gold or gold equivalent. 
in either gold marks or gold coin or gold bullion or it had to be gold. So Germany didn't have enough to be able to do that. And of course they couldn't tax their population. So what'd they do? They started printing. They started devaluing their currency. And essentially they had two systems of currency in 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 their country. They had gold, they had the gold marks, and then they had the the regular marks, which were not convertible into gold. Because the country needed the gold to pay their war reparations. So citizens didn't have it. And because they had just come out of World War I, the population in Germany was already poor. So there really wasn't anything for them to tax to pay for the war reparations. So they just decided to print. And that's exactly what's happened in Venezuela right now today. So they hyperinflated their currency. And it just, it, it went crazy. It went from basically a one to one, one, one mark to the U.S. dollar to over a trillion marks to the U.S. dollar in, in just a few years. They just kept devaluing the currency. Well, during these riots the other day, I think it was two nights ago, maybe it was, yeah, I think it was two nights ago. A friend of mine on Facebook said how crazy it was. She actually lives in um, Minneapolis. And she was basically asking the question, well, how long is this going to go on for? I told her, I said, oh, this is just getting started. You ain't seen nothing yet. And she wrote back and she's like, just getting started, really? I'm like, yes. Because I just got done reading this book. I just got done reading the history of the responses of the people and the government in Germany when they went through their hyperinflation, when they were going through this exact same scenario. Now, we're not at the point that Germany was with their massive hyperinflation, but it didn't start off massive. It started off exactly as it is right now, today. It started with people not having jobs. And those that did have jobs, they didn't know whether or not they were going to have them on a week-to-week -week basis because of what was going on in the economy. Because the treaty restricted how much they were allowed to produce. And the production left the country. It was just flat-out extracted by France. I think Belgium was another one. The UK. They basically extracted the entire country. Now, the United States did not sign on to that treaty. So we were not involved with the socioeconomic destruction of Germany after World War I. That's why we didn't get involved in World War II right away. A lot of people think that the Great Depression started in 1929. It did not. That's when it started in the United States. The Great Depression started in Germany in 1919 with that hyperinflation, and it just moved all around the world until it finally hit the United States. Now, what happened in Germany? as they went through this hyperinflation. People were doing exactly what they're doing right now. They were protesting. 
a lot of the people in this book goes into very descriptive detail about what happened. A lot of these people didn't even really know what they were protesting about. They were protesting the food costs going up. Gasoline costs. Lack of employment. Lack of regular pay. Lack of the availability of currency. So what did the government do? They just started to print money, and they started to give it out. They were giving out unemployment benefits, exactly like what we're doing right now, but it wasn't enough. They give them just enough to keep them calm, but not enough for them to get ahead. At the same time, they had supply chains broken. People in the country would not give food to the people in the cities. They were holding it for themselves because they needed it. So the people in the city started starving. So as you had the breakdown of society go further and further and further down, the government kept printing, 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 and eventually the currency collapsed. But all during that time, from 1919 to 1925, there were protests, there were riots, there was looting, there was stealing. The, there was, it was an entire breakdown of the German society. Law-abiding people became non-law-abiding people. And who did they blame? Did they blame the politicians? In part, they did. Now, let me talk about the politicians and the police. Because in Germany, it's very interesting what, the, what occurred there. In the process of all the protesting and the riots and the looting and everything that they did over there, Unlike here in the United States where we're looting businesses and stuff, sure, those people there did loot businesses, but mainly because they needed food, they needed clothing, and they needed fuel. Either fuel for their vehicles or fuel for farm machinery or just to heat their homes. So when they went out looting, to break into a business or something like that, or somebody else's house, it was to take, extract resources that were needed to survive. Not like what you're seeing here in the United States today with the looting, grabbing TVs and beer and clothes, expensive watches, although they did take watches because that could be traded for food or something like that later on. And eventually that's what ended up happening in Germany was the currency got to the point where they, it wouldn't, wasn't accepted at all and you had to barter. Now let me go back to the politicians and to the police. Because those people became targets. And there were hundreds and hundreds of politicians that were executed by the mobs in Germany. Same thing with the police. They went after government officials during their rioting and looting because they knew who to blame for the problems that they were having. Now, who else did they blame? Yes, they did blame the Jews, which led to the rise in World War II of the slaughter of six million Jews. Now remember, there were six million Jews that were killed during World War II under Hitler. Now, where did Hitler come from? His rise to power started during the hyperinflation in the early 1920s. That's where he got a name for himself. He was one of the 
organizers of the protesters. Not just the protesters, but workers as well and other things. But he became very predominant at the time. He was young, and he was just getting his, his stardom at the time. He was just beginning to come to have some sort of recognition. Now, one thing that I read in this book that I found very interesting is I never understood why the Germans hated the Jews. But after reading this book, now I understand why. Prior to the hyperinflation in Germany, a lot of the Jews were business owners and they were bankers, politicians. These were people that had wealth. They didn't have a lot of it necessarily in the beginning, but what ended up happening is as the hyperinflation continued, they became more wealthy. And there were a lot of German people that resented that the Jewish businessmen became more wealthy as they got poor. So they weren't happy about that. Now, if they had just gotten wealthy and left it at that, I don't think they would have really been a target. But it's what they did during that hyperinflation as they got wealthier that made them a target. And what did they do? They actually started flaunting their wealth, buying expensive furs, cars, homes, things like that. And they were flaunting it. They weren't trying to educate people to try to rise up other people, get them to, to raise their standard of living and to get them out of poverty. They weren't doing that. They were just keeping everything for themselves and not helping others that were starving. And this is one of the reasons why Hitler was able to rise to power and then he went after the Jews and extracted all their wealth by force in the 1930s. Hitler came to power in 1933. It was February of 1933 when he was elected as the Chancellor of Germany. Burning of the Reichstag happened on February 27th, 1933. Hitler created the Enabling Acts, which suspended the German Constitution, and the Weimar Republic died on that day. And that's when the Third Reich was created. That's when it became Nazi Germany. The Enabling Acts were put into place. Weimar Republic that was created after, or during, uh, yeah, right after World War I, ceased to exist. And of course, anybody who knows anything about the history of World War II, how bad that was, it lasted in Germany from 1933 until 1945. Now keep in mind, the United States at the time was at the height of their Great Depression in 1933. And I've talked quite a bit about what happened in 1933. But in reading this book, it was very interesting to see a lot of the parallels of what's happening here in this country right now, today, and what happened in Weimar Republic, Germany, at the end of World War I, until 1925. Now, they did finally get their currency under control. They changed the currency. And when they did that, they had a stable currency, but then they had massive unemployment. And that massive unemployment was the final blow that enabled Hitler to rise to power. 
in less than eight years. He was a member of their parliament, and then he became the chancellor. But the six-year period from 1919 through 1925 were really bad in Germany. And what we're seeing is a lot of the same things today here that Germany was going through back then. So I strongly suggest that you get a copy of the book When Money Dies by Adam Ferguson, written in 1975. Because it'll give you an idea of what's going on and the history behind what happened in Germany and what's going on today. You'll see the parallels. So, just like in Germany, there was a lot of things that were going on in the country that people didn't fully understand, but yet they protested and rioted, and their standard of living went down as a result of the actions that government took. Now, we're seeing the same thing here. You've got protests that are going on right now. In this country, you got rioting and looting. And why are these people rioting and looting? Why are they protesting? Sure, some of them are protesting the pol police brutality. I certainly don't like it. I have never been for it. One of the pivotal moments in my life was watching what happened in Waco, Texas in 1993. Now, I had already seen two other incidences that were very similar in the country prior to Waco. About six months earlier, in August of 1992, there was the Weaver incident in Idaho. It happened at Ruby Ridge. It's called Ruby Ridge. But even prior to that, in 1985, I believe it was, either 85 or 86, one or two, I think it was 85. There was a group in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the name of the group was called MOVE, M-O-V-E. Don't remember what it stood for, but they essentially had control of an apart apartment complex, the whole building. I think they were involved in some kind of bank robberies or some petty crime, maybe some drug dealing or something. But anyway, they, they became a target of the Philadelphia Police Department. Police Department went in there. They barricaded themselves in. They wouldn't come out. So what did the Philadelphia Police Department do? Well, they set the place on fire. And in so doing, they sent many other buildings on fire in the process. The, the city of Philadelphia burned for days took days for them to get that fire out. But I watched that on television, you know, when I was a young teenager. I must have been about probably 13 or 14 at the time, I guess. Somewhere around there. Now, my dad was a cop. So I grew up with law enforcement. All my dad's friends were cops. Or at the house all the time. I went to his office all the time in San Francisco when I was a kid. I have his badges here. I have his guns here. I have his handcuffs here. I have his credentials here. I've got all that stuff here. My dad was a cop starting in 1969. He retired in 2004. So I've seen how they operate. I've seen the good things that they've done. I've seen some of the bad things that they've done over the years. My dad's department was involved in part with the Donald Scott case in California. You can look that one up. That was another tragedy. Now, Donald Scott was not a black guy. He was a white guy. A lot of people... 
in the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas were white. There were some black people there too. Uh, in fact, I uh, can't remember his name. Um, if you look up the uh, cell phone calls of the 911 calls coming out of the Branch Davidians going to the police department during the raid on February 28th, 1993, the guy that's on the phone making the call was a black man. He was actually the first black Harvard Law School graduate. Can't remember his name. I think it was Martin. Something Martin, if I remember correctly. Now, there were there was another case that I talked about earlier, I mentioned earlier, and that was the, uh, the Weaver incident at Ruby Ridge. Now, at the time in the media, they said that Randy Weaver was a white supremacist, and that just that wasn't true. He was a white separatist. He believed in the separation of the races. They should be kept basically separate. And he was a separatist. You know, he just wanted to be left alone. But he made the mistake of going to the Aryan Nation's basically annual cookout gathering. And he was set up by the ATF. And they went after him and they wanted him to infiltrate the Aryan Nations. And he wanted no part of that. He wasn't going to be a snitch and he didn't want to, he didn't want to in- infiltrate the Aryan Nation. So. He declined their offer, and he was prosecuted. And his wife and son were killed as a result. So I've seen what law enforcement can do. So it's not just black people or brown people. There's been a lot of white people that have gone down too. And I'm just as angry about that as I am to what happened with George Floyd. Now let's talk about George Floyd because I touched on this earlier. When they first came out and started showing the video of this guy, George Floyd, down on the ground, face down, and the cop just sitting there with his hand in his in one pocket holding them down on the ground, I was like, what the hell is this? You look at that cop, and the cop is totally calm. He's, he is pushing down on him, but it's not like he's grinding him down. He's just putting pressure on there and he's got his hand in his pocket, and he's totally calm. He's not wrestling with the guy. The guy's not putting up any resistance. George Lloyd is not putting up any resistance at all. The calmness of that officer was very telling. Because that tells you that it has to be one of two things. Either A, that officer was extremely evil and was doing what he was doing just to be evil. Or the other thing, he's posing for the cameras, for the people that are around him. Now let me talk about the people that were, her, that were around him that filmed that. Because that's a interesting thing. You know, if you believe that somebody's life is being threatened by the police, you have a duty and you have the legal ability to be able to stop it. Now, there were multiple cameras there. 
why didn't one of those people push that cop off of him? I know why. And you do too. Because had somebody done that, that person would have been arrested by the other cops that were there. But here's the thing, it was on film. A third-party justification of self-defense could easily be made in that case, and any jury would see that. And the person would be let go. The chances are the, the charges would have, been, would have been dropped. So that cop that was doing that was very calm. So like I said, either A, he was e e evil, it was holding them down there you know, to basically flaunt his authority or, or, or whatever. Or the other possibility is, for the calmness, is that it was staged. And I believe it was the latter. I didn't think that at first. I thought that maybe that was a possibility because of the calmness. But I'm like, well, maybe he's just holding them down until others get there. Now, I didn't see the other videos at that point. But then I saw a strange post on Facebook. Now, of course, you have to be very careful to vet information that you see on social media. But one of the posts that I saw, somebody said that they knew each other. That George Lloyd knew this cop. And my first thought was the O.J. Simpson case and Mark Furman. Because O.J. Simpson and Mark Furman were friends. And I know that for a fact because my dad worked that case. So when I saw that on social media, on Facebook, I was like, oh, wait a minute here. If they know each other, then that kind of leads to the possibility of this being staged. Now, I worked in the media after I got out of high school for five years. And the one thing that I learned in the media is the first reports that you hear in a story are almost always tr the truth because they haven't been sanitized yet. I can't tell you how many stories would come down off of the wires on the news feeds that we had. Because that was one of my jobs, was to go through those news feeds and to pull those stories as they came down off the wire. We didn't have a computer at the time. It was just the printer hooked up, and when a story came off, eh, 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 and this paper would start to spit out. One of those dot matrix printers, you know, with the holes on the side coming out of a big box of paper all staggered. My job was to go through all that, to separate them out, categorize them, and get them ready for the news broadcasts. And I can't tell you how many stories I would see where you have the original story that would come out on something, an hour Hour and a half later, update. It would be an update, and the wording would be changed. The details would be changed. And it wasn't the same story that you had originally. Now, unless it's a major breaking event, the public doesn't see those stories. They don't see those stories because 
there's always a lag from the time that they come down off the wires to the time that they're actually put out on the air. Usually uh, the lag time could be anywhere from 30 minutes to 90 minutes. Depending on your, on your cycle, on your, on your, on your uh, broadcast clock when you do news. Sometimes it's even longer, depending on the station, when they do news. So that when, they, when they read it as a breaking news story, they're going to read the most up-to-date one first. And they're going to disregard all the earlier ones. So I got online and I started looking. And I found a story... And it was, uh, I believe it was from Bloomberg. It's either Bloomberg or Forbes, one of the two. And they had interviewed the owner of the nightclub that both George Floyd and this police officer both worked at. Now, the owner said that they worked opposite shifts, that he didn't think that they knew each other. Now, if they were just security guards by themselves working opposite shifts, that would be believable. To me, that would be believable. And here's why. If I come in at 8 o'clock at night and get off at, say, 3 in the morning, and then the next one comes in the next night, Yeah, you wouldn't see each other. But according to the story, that cop had worked security at that bar or that nightclub for a number of years. Like 16, 17 years. It was a decade and a half. Now, George Floyd, according to the article that I saw, had worked there for all of 2019, according to the owner. But I'll reiterate, the owner said he didn't think that they knew each other because they had worked opposite shifts. But there's a problem here. The cop that killed him, and I don't even know his name, but the cop that killed him was a licensed police officer. Now, when you work in a police department, and I know this because my dad worked in the police department, and he also actually worked security from time to time. Usually the licensed police officer is the one that does the training of the other security officers. Not only do they do the training, but they also brief the other security officers. Incidents that occur in the nightclub that the others may need to be aware of, people they should be looking for to throw out or to not let in as soon as they see them. So I find it kind of hard to believe that George Floyd worked at this nightclub for an entire year all of 2019 and that this cop that killed him had worked there for 15 years, but they never saw each other. I don't buy that. I don't buy that for a minute. So that begins to point to the possibility of this being staged. Because if they knew each other, then by definition you have a conspiracy. You have a conspiracy to commit a crime. Now, what other pieces of evidence do we have to point to the possibility 
of a conspiracy. Well, there's two more. Number one, I'm sitting there and I'm watching TV. I'm watching the news. And I think it was on Friday. But I see across the bottom of the screen on the ticker there on Fox News. And it says, talks about the, uh, the autopsy of George Floyd. And on the scroll, on the bottom of the screen there, it says that the medical examiner said that George Floyd did not die by asphyxiation. That he had drugs in his system and that was the contributing cause of death. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, now wait a minute here, that doesn't make any sense. We saw that officer holding him down with his knee. He's got his hand in his pocket. He's got basically his whole weight down on him, and he's calm. And I've already confirmed through mainstream news articles that they probably knew each other. A very high probability that they knew each other. Now, let's go back to March 4th and the CDC. And what does the CDC do with this COVID-19 bullshit? They put out an order to all the hospitals, doctors, and medical examiners on how they should falsify the deaths to pump up the numbers for COVID-19. Then they updated that order on April 4th. And that's the one that you can see online on the CDC today. It's that seven-page document that actually shows how to falsify the data. How to falsify the death records. So now they've already gotten the medical examiners into a normalcy of falsifying the death records of an individual that comes through their morgue. Well, that's just one more link in the circumstantial chain of a probable conspiracy. Now, there's one final one. And I didn't know this until last night. Because I had only seen the one video where it's showing that cop on him from the front. I was not aware until last night that there were two others on his midsection and on his legs behind the car because somebody was filming from their back. You could see him spread out on the floor. You could see George Floyd down on the ground spread out on his stomach cop that gets charged that killed him is at his neck and his upper body. Another officer is in his midsection, holding him down uh, his butt. And then you had another one at his legs, holding him down there. So he's not moving. He's not resisting. And then you had the one officer that was standing there observing the whole thing, which is why all four of them got, you know, let go. So they ended up charging the one. And the other three should be charged because clearly they killed them. Now, was it a premeditated murder? I don't think so because I think that the thing was staged for whatever reason. Now, I do not believe that any of those police officers are going to go to trial. I don't think they're going to see the inside of a courtroom in a trial. I think every one of them, one of them or all of them, are going to be Epstein. They're going to to be found dead. 
they're going to call it, quote, suicide. Or they'll be in the police, in the jail, and some other inmate will kill them. Now, why would they stage this? Well, we just had a case last year, a year and a half ago. The Jesse Smollett case. That was staged. That was 100% staged. And that was in Chicago, which is not too far away from Minneapolis. Now, there was a coordinated effort with the Smollett case to have some kind of a racially charged event to where there would be public outrage over what supposedly happened to Jesse Smollett. Smollett was charged, charges were dropped, possibly going to be reinstated. I don't know where the case is now. I haven't been following it, but I do know that he hired two guys that were black to help him stage this event. Now, this guy, Jesse Smollett, his entire acting career is gone. He'll never work in that industry again. Who knows what he's going to be doing from this point forward, but he's never going to work as an actor again. I don't think anybody's going to hire him because he's he's lost his credibility because he got caught. Now, if he had hired white guys to do what they did, maybe they wouldn't have been able to figure it out. Maybe his story would have been a little bit more believable. Now, in the case of George Floyd, it looks like it was staged. Now, who did the staging? Did the police do the staging? Or did George Floyd do the staging? Now, in the article that I read from the UK, I think it was BBC, it had a uh, dossier on George Floyd, and it talked about his criminal past, that he had been in prison for like five years, I think in 2007, so he got out, that would be 2012, 2011, somewhere around there. And he was getting his life back together. But from what I understand, he had just recently lost his job at the nightclub because of the hoax virus shutdown. Somebody approached him about possibly being part of this staged event. And that cop accidentally killed him in the course of that stage event, I think that's probably what happened. Now, unless that cop comes to trial for murder, for murder one, I don't think that uh, Minnesota has a death penalty. But if he does come to trial and it is staged, maybe he'll use that as a defense. I don't know, because he's not going to be able to, he's, he's, they, don't, they don't treat cops too well in prison, from what I understand. I know my dad put a cop in prison once. They don't do too well. Because they're not trusted. Certainly aren't liked. But the more details that come out about this case, the more it sounds like it's staged. 
Now, we do know that Antifa and other organizations have staged things, staged protests and riots in the past. And we do know that there are public officials out there that will state shit. Is it possible that the police themselves wanted to stage it? Sure. Absolutely. And this goes all back to the economic conditions in this country. These pensions are not funded. What better way for a city or a police department to get money, extra money, if there's a racially charged incident and they lose a police station. Or a few buildings are burned down or whatever. Was the intent to have a small riot that would break out? I think so. But then you enter in the fact that you've had people in this country, the vast majority of the population in most of the states, locked down for three months. They're not too happy right now. And I said a couple of weeks ago to one of my neighbors, I said that I will not wear a mask, that this whole thing was bullshit, that the whole thing was a hoax. And I reiterated again just a couple of weeks ago, and I said there are going to be riots in this country. When they break out, it's going to break out everywhere, and it's going to be unstoppable. I have been on record saying that from day one one of these lockdowns. I was saying that before I even read in full this book, When Money Dies, about what occurred in Weimar, Germany. Anybody with any critical thinking skills can decipher what the probable outcomes of these events would be. And the very simple fact is, if you treat people like animals, if you keep them locked in their homes, if you keep them from going to movies, to concerts, to the grocery store in a lot of cases, to school, out to restaurants, if you treat them like animals, they're going to act like animals. And the younger generation is doing exactly that. For the last 15 years at least, maybe we're going on 20 now, but for at least the last 15 years, these younger kids of Gen Y, have been raised to glorify a prison culture. Look how they wear their pants. Listen to the music, the rap music that they're listening to, that has been pushed since the end of adolescence of my generation. Now, do I like some rap music? Sure, there's some stuff back in the 80s and and 90s that I kind of like. But a little bit of it goes a long way. I'm not much into it. But a lot of that rap music has contributed to this because it's glorified a gang lifestyle. We've had the entire society
basically, they've been dumbed down and they've been dehumanized. I mean, do you really think that all of this that these people have been subjected to over the last tw- two decades hasn't had an effect on their psyche? Especially because starting in the latter part of the 90s, they started medicating all, all of them. Putting them on Ritalin, putting them on Prozac, putting them on Zola. You couple that with a lockdown, you got people that are depressed. You got kids that are killing themselves. You got adults that are killing themselves too. So you think that this isn't going to have an effect on these kids? These young people? I saw a news report. There were children as young as 10 years old. Involved in these melees around the country. Where are the parents? Are these kids by themselves or are they with their parents doing the same shit? In some th- cases, I think it's both. I really do. I think it's both. Some of the parents are doing this stuff. They're bringing their kids along and the kids are having a good old time as well. Why not? They can't go to Disneyland. Can't go to Knott's Berry Farm or Six Flags. Can't go to a concert. Can't go to a football game. Can't go to a baseball game. What else are these kids going to do? Hell, they're not even going to school. I mean, as bad as the schools are because they've done these kids down, they really shouldn't be in school anyway, but they do need the socialization interaction. Human beings are social creatures. They have to have the ability to socialize. And when you take that away and you lock them up in their homes, scaring the hell out of them over a fake virus, those people, they're not afraid now. Oh, yeah, they're wearing masks. Sure, they're wearing masks. Why? Because it interferes with the facial recognition software. So that's where we're at. And in the meantime, look what's happened. This entire country has been completely devastated. First, they destroy the economy and throw us into a massive depression with a hoax virus. And then, with a probable staged event, another staged event. These people incite riots all over the country. This is just something to think about. Now, how do I feel about all of this? I'm upset. Does this surprise me? No, because I saw this coming. I saw this coming years ago. And to be honest, I thought it would actually be worse than this. I thought in the cities when the riots broke out that it would be hundreds of thousands of people in each city going off and smashing and burning and looting everything all at once. And I thought there'd be a lot of killings. I thought it would be a flat-out civil war breaking out. We might get there yet. 
This may be a gradual progression of things. And then the the killings and the war and the maiming will really happen. We've been lucky so far. I think there's been only two deaths in this. I, I, I think there was a police officer that was killed in Oakland, and I think that there was somebody this last night, uh, I believe in Kentucky, that was killed. I don't think that there's been any others I haven't seen anyway. I could be wrong. I probably am. There's probably more. But those are the only two that I know of for sure that have been killed. Now, I know that a lot of others have been injured. But I think there's only been two killings, which in and of itself is a miracle, given the circumstances. But these kids, you know, they got nothing to go to. They don't have jobs. And guess what? They have no prospect of any jobs. Because all the businesses that were destroyed because of the lockdown for the hoax virus that weren't going to come back has now been coupled with thousands of businesses that have been absolutely destroyed. Is the currency going to survive this? I don't think so. The market should have dropped 3,000 points today. The circuit breaker should be hitting right now. The market should be down over 7% right now, and the circuit breaker should be kicking in. There should be trading curbs in place right now on the market. Gold should be up at least two or three hundred dollars an ounce right now. It should be over two thousand dollars an ounce right now. Silver should easily be thirty-five, forty dollars an ounce right now with the events that we've got going on in this country. And the thing is, the economic situation is the same in this country as it is in every other country on this planet right now. Why? Because the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, and that is what is collapsing. And unlike what has happened in the past, there hasn't been anything to replace it. During the beginning of the Great Depression in the United States, in 1929, we, if you don't count bank deposits, we had eight separate currencies circulating in this country. Eight. They were all different. Eight of them. In 1933, we lost one... Two of them in 1935, we lost another one, so they dropped it down to five. And it stayed at five until uh, it was, well, 1964. They dropped it down to four, but essentially they kind of replaced one. But it didn't. But you can't really count that for obvious reasons. The coinage. Because they did change that in 1964. But in 1971, when we completely decoupled off a of goal, it basically went down to one. The Federal Reserve note. And that's what's collapsing. That's what's completely collapsing. Because the mechanism by which the Federal Reserve note comes into existence from 1971 on is different than how all the other seven currencies came into existence prior to that. It 
So up until 1971, we always had multiple currencies in the country as backups. We don't have that now. And they've printed the Federal Reserve note, the U.S. dollar, into oblivion. And look where interest rates are. So because of that, we have these serious economic problems. Now there are fixes to this. Whether or not they're going to be implemented, I doubt it. I think they're just, they're going to let this whole thing collapse. Who knows? Maybe they uh, have a plan and they just haven't implemented it yet. Maybe they don't have a plan at all. Maybe that's why we're going through what we're going through. Maybe that's why Trump hasn't been out on television. He should be out now as I'm doing this. I'll have to go back and look at the, the footage later. Watch some of the news reports. But I wanted to get on here and I wanted to talk about this because I hadn't done a video for a while. And I thought that they needed to talk about some of this stuff. And I'm going to be doing other videos and doing other rants like this as well. Because it's very important. My theme is, is if you can protect yourself, then do so. If you're in the markets, you sh probably should start pulling some of that money out. Get money into cash. Have some cash. Have some gold. Have some silver. Both in your bank accounts and at home in physical form. Get food. Get water. Stock up on a few things. This is only going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to go through exactly what Germany did. But even if we go through half as much, let's just say half. That means the dollar is going to be inflated. It also means that there's going to be at least Three years of this, probably. Maybe longer. Minimum of two. More likely, the minimum is going to be three. But during the Great Depression, we didn't fully come out of that until the 50s. And to give you an idea about the gold moves, remember the U.S. dollar was backed by gold prior to 71. Now, if you look at the movement in gold, there hasn't been any other asset that has beat it. A lot of people say that the stock market has done better than gold. Well, if you're looking at it from the 1980 high of gold to current, that's true. If you're looking at it from, say, 2000 to current, that's true. But if you look at it from, say, 1964, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71. Gold has outperformed the markets. The Dow Jones Industrial Average since 71 has gone up by a factor of 20, 26, I believe. 26 or 27. 
Gold has gone up by a factor of 52 since 71. So gold has outperformed the stock market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, almost two to one. If you look at the S&P, it's not that much difference. The S&P 500 did a little bit better than the Dow by a factor of, by a factor of two. Anyway, it looks like I might have to wrap this up because it looks like we got some people walking around outside. I should bring the camera in. Otherwise, who knows? My neighbors might think I'm spying on them or something. I don't know. But yeah, I've been ranting here for a while. It's been uh, almost, what, 75, 80 minutes. So I think I'm going to go ahead and end this video and I'm going to do more of these in the future. Anyway, hope you get something out of this. If you like this, push the like button, subscribe. By the way, uh, I've hit over 500 subscribers. I uh, thank those that have subscribed. I hope you like these videos. And we'll be putting more of them out. More of them out. I got uh, get Scott back on here again. And we'll do some more stuff. Probably start doing more of it uh, as things go. But uh, yeah, I'm going to keep on doing these videos. I've been asked to do shorter ones. Um, I am going to do some shorter ones. Personally, I like doing long ones. I, I, I personally like to listen to longer videos, which is why I do them long. You know, for those that do like them long, if you want to just put them on when you're going to sleep or exercising or going for a walk or whatever. It's nice to have them kind of long for that reason. But yes, um, I have had people comment about doing shorter ones, and I, I do need to do that, and I do plan on doing that. But in order to do them smaller, I'd actually have to script them a little bit better. I'd have to do them scripting instead of ad-libbing them, which is a lot more difficult for me. It's, easy, it's just easier for me to ad-lib for the most part. Now, unless I'm actually, you know, showing you something and then I have a harder time ablibbing than I do when I'm just doing a rant like this. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and cut this off and I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.